Part 5, Section 2, Chapter 21 of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 21, Communistic Churches. Several attempts at a realization of the unity and community of goods of the early church have been made on American soil. These organizations, for the most part, have been established on ostensibly Christian and biblical principles, and therefore deserve a brief treatment in a history of the American church. The first of these in point of time is the German Seventh-day Baptists. They were founded by Conrad Biesel, who came to this country in 1720. He very soon became dissatisfied with the views of the Tunkers, of which body he was a member, and began to advocate celibacy and the Saturday Sabbath. He withdrew from all intercourse with his former associates, and established himself as a hermit on the banks of the Cocalico River. He was soon joined by others. In 1728, Biesel formed a monastic order, and built cells at Ephrata, Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Celibacy was required on the part of the monks, but not for other members of the society. The inmates of the cloisters changed their names on assuming the vows of the order, and wore a peculiar garb. In 1740 there were 36 monks and 35 nuns, besides nearly 250 affiliated members. Various mills were operated. The monks gave special attention to printing. Some of the largest publishing undertakings of the entire colonial period were carried on in the German language in the retired settlement of Ephrata. For example, the celebrated Martyr Book, Der Blutige Schauplatz, was translated by them from the Dutch into German and printed here in 1748. It is an immense folio of over 1,500 pages and probably the largest work from the colonial press. Pennypacker refers to the Sabbath school established by Ludwig Hacker of Ephrata, as existing forty years before Rakes's school was formed. Biesel died in 1768. Peter Miller, a convert from the Presbyterians, succeeded him. But the society has steadily gone down, and there are now but few members. The old cloister still stands at Ephrata, and another at Snow Hill, Pennsylvania. The Ephrata community kept up a good reputation for morality and piety, and one cannot but look with regret upon the steady dwindling away of this picturesque band of Baptist monks. The Shakers trace their origin back to the Camisards of France. They say that some of the Camisards went to England in 1706 and formed a society in 1747, which was led by James and Jane Wardley. Anne Lee of Manchester, England, joined this society in 1758. She received revelations from God and went forth to found a new church. Her leadership was accepted by many, and she was regarded as the second appearing of Christ. Acting under a supposed divine revelation, she and nine of her followers set sail for New York, May 19, 1774. A tract of ground was bought, seven miles northwest of Albany, and in 1776 Anne Lee's Pilgrim Church Quote, gathered in its forest home. End quote. A revival of religion at New Lebanon, Columbia County, New York, in 1779, largely increased Lee's company. Quote, the Shakers' first house of worship was built at New Lebanon in 1785. The first gathering into a community was in 1787. Their first written covenant of a full consecration to God of life, services, and treasure was signed by the members in 1795, end quote. Their proper name is Believers in Christ's Second Appearing, but they themselves ordinarily use the name by which they are known to the world. It is derived from one of their chief prophecies, Haggai 2, 6-7, where Christ is promised to appear. They have special points of agreement with the Quakers, especially in simplicity of dress and severe morality of life. Their societies consist of both sexes and all ages. The sexes commingle freely together in social converse, 
and in business and labor. They also worship and eat together, but in separate groups. The most absolute law of celibacy is rigidly enforced upon all. They reject the divinity of Christ. He became the Messiah in baptism. Resurrection is of the soul. The new life comes from the death of sin. The day of judgment is when anyone receives or refuses the Christ life. There is no arbitrary election into eternal life. Probation extends into the next life, and the end of the world comes to every soul when born of the Christ Spirit. The Shakers believe in spiritual communications. They are opposed to war and are loyal to civil government and to the laws of the land, but refuse all general governmental offices. An interesting body of Christians was founded by the weaver George Rapp, who was born at Iptingen, Württemberg, 1770, and died at Economy, Pennsylvania, August 7, 1847. When a young man, he became impressed with the lifeless character of the church, and began to preach in the neighboring villages a return to the apostolic simplicity and earnestness of faith. Persecution was his reward. In 1803, he emigrated to America and made arrangements for the coming of his followers. They responded immediately, and very soon 600 persons had arrived. They purchased land in Butler County, Pennsylvania, along the Conequinessing Creek. On February 15, 1805, the Rappists formally organized themselves into a Harmony Society. Everything was to be thrown into a common stock, a uniform dress to be adopted, and each was to labor for the good of the whole. Rapp was their preacher, teacher, guide, and keeper. He was a man of earnest Christian character, of fine executive ability, and sound common sense. Houses, a church, a schoolhouse, mills, a tannery, and a distillery were built. In 1807, under an impulse of still stricter conformity to the example of Christ, the Rappists avowed celibacy. In 1815, they purchased a tract of 24,000 acres upon the Wabash, Indiana, where they established the New Harmony Settlement. This they sold to Robert Owen in 1824, and the Rappists took up their last abode at Economy, Pennsylvania, 17 miles northwest of Pittsburgh. In 1831, a German adventurer, Bernhard Mueller, introduced dissensions into the colony. And since then, the Rappists have lost heart, sought no more accessions, and have declined. At present, they number only about thirty members. They have a saner theology than the Shakers, though with some suggestions of an extravagant mysticism. They abhor spiritualism, and look constantly for the personal second coming of Christ. Rapp believed that he would live to see this day. With pathetic faith, the venerable reformer, in extreme feebleness, awaiting the approach of death, said, quote, If I did not know that the dear Lord meant I should present you all to him, I should think my last moments come. End quote. Very similar in origin to the Rappists is the Separatist Society of Zoar. These Zoarites also arose in Württemberg and brought upon themselves the wrath of the established church by their refusal to send their children to the clerical schools. The government also treated them harshly on account of their disinclination to bear arms. Some English Quakers assisted them to emigrate. They arrived in Philadelphia in August 1817 and at once bought a tract of 5,600 acres in Ohio. Their headquarters are at Zoar, Tuscawaras County, Ohio. They chose Joseph Baumelar as leader. They established a community of goods. In 1832, they sought for incorporation, taking the name of the Separatist Society of Zoar. They have prospered greatly in worldly affairs. In principle, they are much like the Quakers. They believe in the Trinity and in the usual Orthodox doctrines. They refuse all titles of honor, address every one as thou, do, reject the sacraments and all ceremonies, have no advanced ministry, and give equal rights to the women. 
Unlike the Rappists, the Zoarites hold that marriage is honorable. They are a pious and industrious folk, but have made little effort towards intellectual culture. John H. Noyes, the founder of the Oneida community, applied the doctrines of communism to persons as well as to property. He graduated at Dartmouth College in 1830, studied theology at Andover and New Haven, and was licensed to preach in 1833. He embraced, however, some strange doctrines. He held that the second coming of Christ took place soon after his ascension, that we are therefore living in a new dispensation in which personal communication with Christ secures salvation from all evil and sin, even disease and death itself. He sought to carry out his theories in two settlements organized on the most unregulated application of the theory of, quote, having all things in common, end quote. These communities were at Oneida, Madison County, New York, and at Wallingford, Connecticut. For thirty years, Noyes's experiment went on with much success, 1848 to 79. For some years before 1878, Professor Mears, of Hamilton College, led a crusade against the immoral practices of the society in respect to the community of wives, and in 1879 this social feature was abandoned. Other changes followed. In 1880, communism in goods was superseded by a joint stock arrangement, and the community was reorganized and incorporated as the Oneida Community Limited. The community carries on several manufactories and has attained to considerable wealth. The Wallingford community was abandoned in 1880. End of chapter 21Part 5, Section 2, Chapter 22 of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 22, The Mormons. It is impossible to unravel the intricate details of the early history of the most remarkable delusion in the history of religious fanaticism. To give each man who had a part in the promotion of Mormonism his just dues, to find out in whose mind it had its inception, to tell the exact part each played in that strange role, this is indeed a difficult task. Witsit has taken up this work with great thoroughness, and it seems probable that his results are not far from the truth. Three men laid the foundations of Mormonism. The first was Solomon Spaulding. He may be called its unconscious prophet. He was an erratic Presbyterian preacher of western Pennsylvania, who was taken up with theories of millennialism, return of the Jews, and the Indians as descendants of the ten tribes of Israel. He set forth these and other theories in a series of weak romances, one of which, the Book of Mormon, written about 1812, was deposited in the printing office of Patterson and Lambden, Pittsburgh. Spalding died in 1816. He did not give to the subsequent Mormonism its Bible, and his part is exaggerated by some, but it is indisputable that one, if not more, of his wild romances was at the foundation of the sacred book of the Latter-day Saints. Sidney Rigdon had the largest part in this literary history. Without intending it, he really founded the absurd Roman system. He was born in St. Clair Township, Allegheny County, Pennsylvania, February 19, 1793. He became a Baptist minister in 1819, but was converted into a firm belief in the views of the Disciples of Christ in 1821. The Disciples were literalists in their interpretation of Scripture, and when Rigdon came into the possession of Spalding's manuscripts at the bankrupt sale of the Pittsburgh printers, he at once began to revise these writings, make large additions to them, and impregnate them through and through with the disciple theology. Rigdon's thought seems to have been to make these supposed revelations the medium of the founding of a church which would completely embody his ideals. 
Rigdon was, in his way, a brilliant and audacious man, and he succeeded in his work beyond his expectations. A helper appeared at the right moment. This was Joseph Smith, a young man of Manchester, Ontario County, New York. He was born in Sharon, Windsor County, Vermont, December 23, 1805. Quote, his family led a sort of gypsy existence from 1804 to 1815, changing their places of residence seven times in that period, end quote. Their last abode was in Palmyra, Wayne County, New York. Joseph Smith was fond of divination, fortune-telling, discovering hidden treasures, and with his divining rod and seer stare, he traveled over New York State, attracting considerable attention. He had formerly been connected with the Methodists. He claims to have been the subject of visions and strange dreams. He united a visionary and emotional temperament with considerable shrewdness and sagacity. Rigdon fell in with him September 21st, 1823. Smith was captivated with the Pittsburgh minister's ideas and plans. The Book of Mormon, as edited by Rigdon, was published in March 1830. The first church was enrolled at Manchester, New York, April 6, 1830. The singular book, thus destined to figure so largely in the religious history of the country, professed to give the fortunes of the Aborigines of America from the time of their leaving the Bible lands until the time when a part of them were annihilated in the great battle of Camorra Hill, Ontario County, New York, A.D. 384. Of those who escaped in that battle were Mormon and his son Moroni. Mormon collected the sacred books of the kings and priests, containing God's revelations, which were supplemented by Moroni, who buried them in the hill of Camorra with the divine assurance that God's true prophet would some day discover them and publish them to the world. This volume, consisting of thin gold plates, Smith professed to have discovered. The reality of this, with several angelic interferences besides, was attested by the oath of Smith's amanuenses, Cowdery, Whitmer, and Martin Harris, all of whom, however, subsequently withdrew their oath and denounced the whole story as an imposture. The first gathering place of the Mormons was at Kirtland, Ohio, 1831. Many joined them. It is here that we first hear of Brigham Young, also a Vermonter, whose father had settled at Sherburne, Shenango County, New York. Brigham joined the Mormons in 1831, and his strong and determined character at once made an impression on the Kirtland colony. Missionaries were sent to England and the continent of Europe, and Young himself undertook the conversion of the New Englanders but the new religionists made themselves obnoxious to the people of the town. Persecution arose, and they were driven out. A like fate overtook a section that went into Jackson County, Missouri. These latter were driven from county to county, until, in 1839, they were expelled from the state altogether. The Kirtland Band, with many new converts, moved in 1838 to Nauvoo, on the Mississippi River, Illinois. Here they built a large town, constructed a temple, and were enjoying a prosperous existence when persecution once more arose. Their claims as the only true people of God, their revelations, the new doctrine of polygamy which it was reported Smith had received by special communication from God, and the implicit obedience required by their prophet, these things, acting on the inflamed religious prejudices of the Gentiles, caused an unfortunate outbreak. Smith was arrested and imprisoned. On June 27, 1844, a mob broke into the jail at Carthage, near Nauvoo, and shot Joseph Smith and his brother Hiram. This cruel and causeless murder threw the halo of martyrdom around the head of the first prophet of Mormonism, and bound his followers together as though around a sacred cause. The tireless energy and diplomacy of Brigham Young had supplanted Rigdon and virtually retired him. 
Young was elected president. He cared nothing for revelations, but devoted himself with rare ambition and statesmanship to consolidate the Mormons and lead them into territories beyond the hand of the disturber. With a select band of pioneers, he threaded a wild of eleven hundred miles, and on July twenty fourth, eighteen forty seven, the great day of the Mormons, he arrived in the Salt Lake Valley. This was to be the Mormon center. Here the toilsome pilgrimage was to end. The next year, four thousand Mormons were marched with military precision across the great plains and mountains, and as if by magic, Salt Lake City arose. Here Brigham Young reigned a virtual king until his death, August ninth, 1877. The Mormons received constant recruits by the missionary labors of their wily representatives in England, Sweden, and Norway. Their heavy emigration fund, and the glowing descriptions of the El Dorado of the West, with the religious zeal of the missionaries and their constant appeal to the Bible, made an impression upon the poorer classes in the old countries, and won many converts. The Germans and Swiss were less susceptible, and no hearing could be obtained in Roman Catholic countries. In addition to Utah, large colonies were settled in Wyoming, Idaho, and the surrounding states and territories. Brigham Young directed the political fortunes of the Mormon theocracy of the West. He ruled with a rod of iron. He reduced the whole territory of Utah under his sway. The federal authorities were treated with profound contempt. Trains of non-Mormon immigrants were massacred. It was a Mormon empire, in which a military autocracy was sustained by the august sanctions of religious inspiration. At length, after the close of the Civil War, the United States were in a position to regain control of this portion of their domain. A federal governor was appointed. In 1871, polygamy was outlawed and Young arrested. But this advantage was not followed up. Frelinghuysen introduced a bill in 1873 severely censuring polygamy. A more radical measure was reported in 1874. These and later laws were of little effect, however, on account of the difficulty of enforcing them. At length, in 1882, Senator Edmonds, of Young's and Smith's native state, secured the passage of a bill which struck the death blow of polygamy. Many convictions followed this act. Gentile immigration largely increased. Public sentiment, as well as public law, began to work. The leaders saw that the immoral feature of their sect could be no longer maintained. In October 1890, President Woodruff proclaimed to a vast audience in the temple at Salt Lake City that, by divine authority, polygamy was abolished in the Church of the Latter-day Saints. When Joseph Smith was reported to have published his Revelation of Polygamy in 1843, Rigdon strenuously held out against it. In fact, it is claimed that this was merely a ruse of Young's, who was a determined advocate of the new theory. Rigdon and Joseph Smith, Jr., the son of the slain prophet, repudiated Young's authority, and, with many thousands of the best Mormons, refused to join the Utah exodus. They went back to Kirtland, Ohio, and peaceably settled in other parts of the Middle West. After recovering from the shock of Smith's assassination, they launched their bark again under the title of The Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They claim to be the true Mormons, and denounce Young and the larger church as schismatics and impostors. They quote from the Book of Mormon passages strictly forbidding polygamy and concubinage. The courts of Ohio have endorsed their claim to be the legal successors of the original Mormons by giving to them the old temple at Kirtland. They have a publishing house at Lamoni, Decatur County, Iowa, and churches in all the large cities of the Union and many in England. Joseph Smith, Jr. is the president of this body. The Mormons profess to prove all their tenets from the Bible, which is a divine revelation, 
and, along with the Book of Mormon and the Book of Doctrine and Covenants, the standard of faith and practice. They interpret the Bible in a crude and literal fashion. Their own sacred books do not supersede, but rather supplement, the Bible. Prophecy, miracles, and all the apostolic gifts continue in the church to all time. The Epitome of Faith, issued by the Reorganized Church, is a carefully guarded statement of several scriptural doctrines, with some Mormon additions. The Mormon leaders have developed a theocracy fatal to virtue and liberty. It has wound its coils, like an octopus, around both the family and the state, and would have crushed both if it had had the power. The band that remained east of the Rocky Mountains, under the younger Smith, is the only Mormon body that has retained any degree of simple and scriptural faith. It is guiltless of the crimes that stain the reign of Brigham Young. Missionary work is now being carried on in Utah by the various evangelical denominations. The non-Mormon element has become so strong that the government of Salt Lake City has at length been wrested out of the hands of the hierarchy. Of all the frontier fields in the United States, no parts are so difficult for the minister of the gospel as those of Utah and the surrounding regions where Mormonism has held sway and breathed its mildew. End of chapter 22 Part 5, Section 2, Chapter 23 of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 23, The Anti-Slavery Reform. The history of slavery in America is contemporary with the history of the country. In 1619, a Dutch frigate stopped at Jamestown, Virginia, and sold 14 Negroes to the colonists. English merchants carried on the trade assiduously. The Royal African Company, chartered by Elizabeth, agreed to furnish in 33 years 144,000 Negroes, many of them to the American colonies. The colonists, as a rule, had few, if any, scruples on the subject. The Virginian settlers of North Carolina carried their slaves with them. South Carolina was settled by planters from Barbados, whence slaves were brought by one of its earliest governors, Sir John Yeamans. The only colony in which slavery was outlawed was Georgia, and this, according to Bancroft, was not due to the humane sentiments of Oglethorpe, but to public interest and safety. In 1743, the anti-slavery laws were repealed. The cultivation of cotton, rice, and sugar in the South naturally attracted slave labor to that region, and although, on account of climate and other considerations of convenience, the northern states employed less and less of slave labor, the merchants of Boston, Salem, Newport, New York, and other northern cities carried on the slave traffic with great enterprise and zeal. In many cases, the outborn cargo was rum, which was exchanged in Africa for Negroes, who were brought to the southern states and became a part of the inheritance which only a great war destroyed. 300,000 slaves were imported into the colonies previous to 1776. Early voices were not wanting against slavery. Its inconsistency with the Declaration of Independence was the occasion of taunts without number. As might be expected, the New England states developed the earliest anti-slavery sentiment. As early as 1703, a verdict of damages in favor of a slave for the recovery of wages and freedom for the years after the age of 21 was rendered by a Connecticut court. In 1766, a similar verdict was given by the Superior Court of Salem, Massachusetts. In 1780, the Bill of Rights, declaring that, quote, all men are born equally free and independent, end quote, was adopted by Massachusetts. It accompanied the Constitution of 1780 and was drawn up by John Adams. 
On the strength of this bill, the Supreme Judicial Court declared that slavery was abolished in Massachusetts. A similar decision did the same thing for New Hampshire, and so strong was the sentiment in Vermont that the first article of its Bill of Rights in 1777, before it became a state, branded slavery as an institution unworthy of the support of mankind. The Colonial Congress in 1774 made a similar declaration, quote, We will neither import nor purchase any slave imported, nor will we hold intercourse with those provinces that do not agree with the same, end quote. This healthful feeling pervaded the whole revolutionary period. The spirit of the master, says Jefferson in his Notes on Virginia, quote, is abating, that of the slave is rising from the dust, the way, I hope, preparing for total emancipation. End quote. The revolutionary fathers were sound on this question, and far in advance of their times. Washington, in his will, provided for the emancipation of his slaves. He said to Jefferson that it was, quote, among his first wishes to see some plan adopted in which slavery in this country might be abolished by law. End quote. Franklin became the president of an abolition society in Philadelphia in 1787. John Adams echoed the words of Washington. Every measure of prudence, he said, quote, ought to be assumed for the eventual total extirpation of slavery from the United States. End quote. In 1787, when the Constitution of the United States was framed, slavery would have been abolished by that instrument had it not been for the opposition of South Carolina and Georgia, the inhabitants of which states believed slave labor a financial advantage. They firmly refused to go into the Union at all unless slavery was left untouched. The Friends seem to have been the earliest body to take action against slavery. In 1688, the Germantown, Philadelphia Quakers petitioned the yearly meeting to do something for the overthrow of the institution. Quote, From 1696 to 1776, the society nearly every year declared the importing, purchase, or sale of slaves by its members to be a disownable offense. End quote. John Woolman and Anthony Benazet are illustrious names in the history of this reform, 1746 to 67. Benjamin Lay, also a Quaker, reprinted the tract of Judge Samuel Sewall of Massachusetts, The Selling of Joseph, which was first published in 1700. In 1770, Dr. Samuel Hopkins, a Congregationalist divine, pastor of the First Church, Newport, Rhode Island, began to preach against the slave system. Owing to the energy of its shippers, Newport was the principal slave mart for all the thirteen colonies. Hopkins entered into the controversy with intense earnestness, and his sermons, pamphlets, and newspaper articles exerted a wide influence. He also devised a plan for African colonization and evangelization. Wesley's testimony against slavery was not without effect in America. In 1784, at the organization of the Methodist Episcopal Church, the following were the official records of the church. Quote, we view it, slavery, as contrary to the golden law of God, on which hang all the law and the prophets, and the inalienable rights of mankind, as well as every principle of the revolution, to hold in the deepest abasement in a more abject slavery than is perhaps to be found in any part of the world except America, so many souls that are all capable of the image of God. End quote. Explicit measures were then mentioned for the emancipation of every slave held by any members of the church. This declaration closed thus quote, What shall be done with those who buy or sell slaves or give them away? Answer. They are immediately to be expelled unless they buy them on purpose to free them. End quote. The subsequent history of Methodism, however, marked a continuous retreat from this position until in 1836 the General Conference passed a vote of censure on two of its members for attending an anti slavery meeting in Cincinnati. 
Nevertheless, in 1796, a protest had been made against the, quote, crying evil of African slavery, end quote, and somewhat similar measures of manumission urged upon the church as those outlined in 1784, but this time only in the case of official members. Slave selling, however, was prohibited. In 1800, preachers were particularly designated as the objects of discipline and disgrace in case of holding property in human beings. In 1804, the dissent had gone so far that the discipline, besides paring away the resolutions of 1796, made the following notable concession, quote, the members of our societies in the states of North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and Tennessee shall be exempted from the operation of the above rules. End quote. The Presbyterian Church began its testimony with the same boldness. In 1787, the synods of New York and Philadelphia earnestly recommended abolition of slavery. This judgment was reaffirmed by the General Assemblies of 1793 and 1794. In a note to the 142nd question of the larger catechism, slavery was denounced as man-stealing. Slave-holding, however, was not made a disciplinary offense, and the note on man-stealing was erased in 1816. The Presbyterian Church contented herself with general statements on the evils of slavery, and with urging an ultimate emancipation. A period of quiescence followed. Slavery had become thoroughly entrenched in all the southern states. Any effort at excinding the slaveholding element would have caused a rupture immediately. The Protestant Episcopal and the Roman Catholic churches did not discriminate against the system. Even the Quakers grew cold. Slave owners were freely admitted into the Presbyterian and Methodist churches. The disruption of Methodism, in 1844, was due not to a return to Wesley's high ground of slavery as a sin against God and an outrage on human rights, but to the fact, as asserted in the resolution of the General Conference, that Bishop Andrews' involuntary connection with slavery, quote, would embarrass the exercise of his office as an itinerant general superintendent, end quote. His suspension did not call a halt to the exercise of that spirit of concession which had been a marked feature in all the utterances of the Methodist Episcopal Church. This spirit had gone so far that, in 1836, the General Conference charged the ministers and members of the Church, quote, to abstain from all abolition movements and associations, and to refrain from patronizing any of their publications. End quote. Though the official representatives of Christ were very cautious and conservative, hoping and waiting for a time when Providence would interfere to remove the evil, the gospel had nurtured many a man whose life was devoted to the overthrow of the great curse. Chief of these was William Lloyd Garrison who at an early period said, quote, Emancipation must be the work of Christianity and the Church. They must achieve the elevation of the blacks and place them on the equality of the Gospels, end quote. He was a printer and journalist, and from the time of his association with Benjamin Lundy, an eminent Quaker philanthropist, in the publication of the paper The Genius of Universal Emancipation in 1829, to the final overthrow of slavery, he labored with quenchless devotion to his work. Sometimes mobbed, he pursued his course with an enthusiasm that nothing could daunt. His plans were peaceable. He depended entirely on the force of truth, public sentiment, an enlightened conscience, and moral energy. In accordance with his principles, the New England Anti-Slavery Society was formed in January 1832. Garrison had a host of helpers. It is impossible to do more than mention the names of some of those prophets of the better time, who led for so long what seemed a forlorn hope. Stephen S. Foster, Nathaniel Peabody Rogers, Parker Pillsbury, James G. Burney, Eliza Wright, Jr., Isaac T. Hopper, Garrett Smith, Joshua Levitt, Arthur and Louis Tappan, Oliver Johnson, 
These and many others gave the cause the advocacy of their voice, their pen, their life. The times demanded men of heroic mold. Harriet Martineau calls it the martyr age in America. The mobbing of public speakers was nothing uncommon. The eloquent George Thompson was compelled to flee to England in disguise. Garrison was dragged through the streets of Boston with a rope around his body. Lovejoy was murdered in Alton, Illinois, in 1837. Burney's printing press was destroyed in 1836. It was the martyrdom of Lovejoy that gave Wendell Phillips to the cause. The Fugitive Slave Law of 1850 brought out Theodore Parker. The eloquence of Henry Ward Beecher was enlisted. Noble women like Lydia Maria Child, Lucretia Mott, Abby Kelly, and Mrs. Stowe gave their influence also. That most powerful novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin, 1852, was really, as Nassau W. Sr., the English economist, said, a pamphlet against the fugitive slave law. Whittier was the poet of the movement, helped by other master singers, Bryant, Longfellow, and especially Lowell. But it was reserved by an inscrutable providence that not by the church, nor by philanthropists, nor by law, should American slavery receive its death blow, but by the bloody ordeal of a four years' conflict between the North and the South. Abraham Lincoln signed the death warrant of American, if not universal slavery, by issuing the Emancipation Proclamation on July 1, 1863, a warrant executed by the greatest civil war in all history. The South is acquiescing in this result as a providential deliverance. Her people have learned that slavery was, after all, only a most expensive system, and had they the option today to choose its restoration, they would promptly refuse the offer. The southern people have entered upon a new era of material development and religious prosperity. The American church is girding itself to the solution of the questions presented by the unparalleled spectacle of a race of magnificent possibilities suddenly elevated from the condition of chattels to that of free citizenship. No church in any country has ever been burdened with so great and sudden a responsibility. The future will prove that no church has discharged its delicate and difficult task with more heroic spirit than that of the whole American church. End of chapter 23part 5 section 2 chapter 24 of short history of the christian church by john fletcher hurst this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 24 the temperance reform the colonists took strong ground concerning intemperance plymouth colony in a law of 1658 disfranchised drunkards a man convicted of drunkenness the third time was publicly whipped Governor Winthrop, of the Massachusetts Bay Company, was much grieved at the drinking customs of the time, and forbade all drinking of healths at his table. In 1637, a law was passed prohibiting loafing at taverns. In 1645, innkeepers were fined five shillings for allowing anyone to drink excessively in their taverns. In 1646, a stringent law was passed by the Massachusetts Bay colonists, regulating the sale of liquor and forbidding any disorder in public houses. A prohibitory law was passed in Virginia in 1676, but it had little effect. It is evident, therefore, that in the pre-revolutionary times, the drink curse was recognized as a public calamity, and efforts were made to abate it. Many of the Revolutionary Fathers had decided views on the temperance question. Franklin was a total abstainer and an advocate of abstinence. John Adams thundered against the public house. In his journal, June 4, 1761, he says, quote, "...discharged my venom to Bill Vesey against the multitude, poverty, ill-government, and ill-effects of licensed houses." and the timorous temper, as well as criminal design, 
of the select men who grant them approbation. End quote. Israel Putnam took the same ground. He held that the multiplying of public houses has a tendency, as he says, quote, to ruin the morals of the youth and promote idleness and intemperance among all ranks of people. End quote. He understood the subject thoroughly. On February 27, 1774, the Continental Congress spoke as follows, quote, Resolved that it be recommended to the several legislatures of the United States immediately to pass laws the most effectual for putting an immediate stop to the pernicious practice of distilling grain, by which the most extensive evils are likely to be derived, if not quickly prevented, end quote. This resolution failed of its design, however. The most influential utterance of that time was the essay by Dr. Benjamin Rush, entitled, The Effects of Ardent Spirits on the Human Body and Mind, published in Philadelphia in 1786. This essay was a very intelligent discussion and made a profound impression wherever it was read. Besides, Rush saw to it that it was read. Copies of it were presented to the clergy, and it was sold in tract form by the thousand. Edition after edition was called for. The author visited religious bodies, made speeches before them, and tried everywhere to enlist public sympathy for a temperance reform. His pamphlet was republished in the Gentleman's Magazine, London, in 1786. Rush had a strong belief in the efficacy of religious instruction, and but little faith in law. He says, quote, From the influence of the Quakers and Methodists in checking this evil, I am disposed to believe that the business must be effected finally by religion alone. Human reason has been employed in vain, and the conduct of New England in the Congress has furnished us with a melancholy proof that we have nothing to hope from the influence of law in making man wise and sober. Let these considerations lead us to address the heads and governing bodies of all the churches in America upon the subject. I have borne a testimony, by particular desire, at a Methodist conference against the use of ardent spirits, and I hope with effect. I have likewise written to the Roman Catholic Bishop of Maryland to set an association on foot against them in his society." I have repeatedly insisted upon a public testimony being published against them by the Presbyterian Synod of this city, Philadelphia, and have suggested to our good Bishop White the necessity of the Episcopal Church not standing neutral in this interesting business. End quote. It appears, therefore, that Dr. Rush was the morning star of the Temperance Reformation. He fought for the cause with splendid persistency. It appears also that, as in the case of slavery, the opinions of many of the leading minds in the revolutionary era were far in advance of much of the sentiment of later times. As we have seen, from the support given to Dr. Rush, the churches were not blind to the evils of intemperance. The bold testimony of Wesley prepared the Methodists for a radical position his rule absolutely forbidding the use of intoxicating drinks as a beverage, was adopted at the organization of the American Church in 1784. This action but reaffirmed their utterance at the conferences before they had an independent existence as a church. Thus, in 1783, quote, Should our friends be permitted to make spiritous liquors, sell and drink them in drams? Answer. By no means. We think it wrong in its nature and consequences, and desire all our preachers to teach the people, by precept and example, to put away this evil. End quote. The same declaration was made in 1780. Dorchester quotes a noble statement put forth by Bishops Coke and Asbury, explaining what must then have been considered remarkable legislation. In 1784, the New England Yearly Meeting of Friends condemned the use of ardent spirits, and in 1788 they made abstinence binding upon all their members. The other churches moved later. In 1812, the Presbyterian General Assembly protested, quote, 
not only against actual intemperance, but against all those habits and indulgences which may have a tendency to produce it. End quote. In the same year, the General Association, Congregational, of Connecticut, put forth a manifesto to the same import. In 1818, the Presbyterian Assembly went further and said that men ought to, quote, abstain from even the common use of ardent spirits, end quote. Joseph Talcott, a devout Quaker, was a pioneer reformer. He lived near Auburn, New York, and Professor W. J. Beecher, of Auburn Theological Seminary, has rescued his name from oblivion. Talcott preached abstinence through all that part of the country. This was in 1816. He appeared before the Presbyterian Synod of Geneva, New York, and presented the claims of his cause with such cogency and force that the Synod published his paper with resolutions, quote, fully approving it and solemnly declaring that from that time they would abandon the use of ardent spirits except for medicinal purposes, that they would speak against its common use from the pulpit, and use their influence to prevail with others to follow their example. End quote. About 1819, Judge Hertel of New York published a pamphlet taking common cause with Talcott, and produced a wide impression. In 1810, Dr. Herman Humphrey, pastor of the Congregational Church in Fairfield, Connecticut, preached a series of six sermons on intemperance. Humphrey was thoroughly in earnest and upon assuming the presidency of Amherst College in 1823, he regenerated the spirit of the college with regard to this matter, and made it a powerful focus of temperance light. A remarkable sermon was preached by the Rev. Nathaniel S. Prime, father of the Rev. Dr. S. Irenaeus Prime, before the Long Island Presbytery, November 5, 1812. This sermon produced a profound impression. In his second parish at Cambridge, Washington County, New York, about 1813, Prime organized the farmers of his congregation into a temperance society. Lyman Beecher was the Nestor of that day. In 1825, he preached his six celebrated sermons on intemperance in Litchfield, Connecticut. They were published and had a wide circulation in both this country and Europe. Beecher was the disciple of Rush. The reading of Rush's essay gave him to the temperance cause. Besides that, the treatment accorded to some Indians of his parish by the liquor sellers awoke an abhorrence to the traffic which he ever after retained. Oh, it was horrible, horrible, he says in his autobiography. It burned and burned in my mind, and I swore a deep oath to God that it shouldn't be so. Discussion ripened into organization. Probably the first temperance society was the Union Temperance Society of Moreau, New York, founded in 1808. The following year saw a similar society in Greenfield, also in Saratoga County, New York. In 1813, the Massachusetts Society for the Suppression of Intemperance was organized. Other societies followed. The American Society for the Promotion of Temperance was organized in 1826. The work received great impetus by the first National Temperance Convention held in Philadelphia in May 1833. Up to this time, the principal aim was to abate the evils of drink without specially committing anyone to the principle of total abstinence. The platform of the first National Convention was simply, quote, the traffic in ardent spirits as a drink, and the use of it as such, are morally wrong and ought to be abandoned throughout the world. End quote. That same year saw the Massachusetts Society adopt the Pledge of Total Abstinence. In 1836, the Pennsylvania Society occupied the same ground. The Second National Convention, held in Saratoga in 1836, also flung the banners of total abstinence to the breeze. So rapidly did the more daring principle win adherence. The celebrated Washingtonian movement, originating in Baltimore in 1840, 
led 150,000 men to give up the use of intoxicating liquors. It was the parent of the Order of the Sons of Temperance, which was organized in New York in 1842. The Good Templars Order, the most massive and powerful of all the secret fraternities which have gathered about the temperance idea, originated in New York in 1851. It is a worldwide order. Both it and the Sons of Temperance have exerted an incalculable influence on public opinion, largely through their education of young people. Many other organizations have sprung from the same desperate effort to do something to stem the tide of intemperance. The invocation of law was not long delayed. Eminent jurists gave it as their opinion that the state had the right to prohibit the liquor traffic or to restrict it in any way it thought best, an option that has been confirmed by the Supreme Court of the United States. The Fourth National Convention, held in 1851, recommended prohibitory laws. As early as 1833, American statesmen repudiated the license system as a means of dealing with the traffic. It is surprising what radical temperance measures were passed between 1837 and 1840. There was apparently a better public feeling then than now. Agitation had aroused the public mind. It seemed at one time as though the spontaneous uprising of the people would outlaw the traffic forever. Maine passed her prohibitory law in 1846, and in 1848 made it embrace all intoxicating liquors. Many of the states voted no license. Delaware declared for prohibition by statute in 1847, but the law was adjudged unconstitutional. Massachusetts passed a prohibitory law in 1852. Vermont made a similar law in the same year. New Hampshire in 1855. Rhode Island in 1852. Connecticut in 1854. New York in 1855 and many other states have had at some time a prohibitory law in one or another of its forms. This splendid vantage ground has since been greatly endangered. At the present time, the only states in which prohibition is in force are Maine, Vermont, Kansas, Iowa, and the Dakotas. Many of the states have recently rejected prohibition by immense majorities when submitted to popular vote. The natural law of reaction, the difficulty of enforcing the laws, the swarming of European immigrants, the new force to be reckoned with in those educated under conditions foreign to our own, and who look with supreme impatience on any attempt to regulate their social habits, the conviction of many as to the inexpediency of strict laws against drink, except where sustained by an overwhelming public sentiment, the bad spirit evolved by party bickerings and the mutual denunciations of each other by temperance people over the question of method, the coming in of other great issues, like those which led to the Civil War, the labor disturbances of more recent times, and the new political economy, which is inclined to make bad social conditions the cause of drink rather than vice versa, these and other reasons may have had more or less to do with the present pause in the advance of the temperance reform. Temperance people are hopelessly divided as to method. The liquor interest acts as a unit in all matters affecting itself. But the result of the great moral agitation of this century abides in the entire emancipation of the mass of English-speaking people of North America from the use of intoxicating drinks. Victory will come in the end. The day is sure to dawn when the saloon will be relegated to the realm of antiquities, and will be as great a curiosity as the Virgin, or any other monstrosity in the torture chamber of the Nuremberg Castle. In 1873-74, a remarkable movement began in Ohio. The women formed praying bands, and visited the saloons, imploring their keepers to close. They joined prayer and song with moral suasion. Their reception was varied, and many thrilling incidents occurred. Hundreds of saloon keepers gave up their business, and many more converted and became useful citizens. The general result was most favorable. 
This movement resulted in the formation, in 1874, of the Women's Christian Temperance Union, which has been of incalculable benefit to the great cause of temperance. End of chapter 24「Part 5, Section 2, Chapter 25 of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 25 Philanthropy and Christian Union Philanthropy is a characteristic of present-day Christianity. The effort is made to realize in the life of the Church the healing mission of Christ. That spirit more and more pervades the Church. Sometimes this appears in corporate action, and often in individual consecration. Wealth is poured out in abundance in the founding of institutions of healing and mercy. Men who make but little profession of Christianity are touched by the genius of the gospel, and vie with each other in providing for themselves a monument better far than sculptured stone or storied urn. But much yet remains to be done. This is a ripe field. Rich rewards await the reapers. No sooner had the close of the Civil War thrown upon the country the stupendous problem of fitting an enslaved race for freedom than the churches came forward to freely offer their help. Only five months after the beginning of the war, the American Missionary Association, Congregational, opened a school in Hampton, Virginia, for fugitive slaves. The spot overlooked the waters on which the first slave ship entered the American continent. This school was opened on September 17, 1861. The association extended its work after the close of the war. It now supports some of the best institutions in the South, such as Berea College, Berea, Kentucky, Atlanta University, Fisk University, Nashville, Tennessee, and Strait University, New Orleans. A non-denominational Freedmen's Aid Society was organized in Boston, February 7, 1862, another in New York a few days later, and others in Cincinnati, Chicago, and elsewhere. These societies were consolidated in 1866 under the name of the American Freedmen's Union Commission. The Baptists have pursued this work energetically, beginning as early as 1862, and supporting some of the finest schools in the South. The Free Baptists have Storer College at Harper's Ferry, Virginia. The Friends have not been neglectful of this work, though their object is rather to help the public school system than to establish schools of their own. The Methodist Episcopal Church established its Freedmen's Aid Society on August 6, 1866, and has put money and men without stint into this field. The Presbyterians organized their work in 1865, as did also the Episcopalians. The method of all these and other societies is to unite religion and education. Education is interpreted liberally. It includes industrial, normal, biblical, classical, and professional departments. The Negro is found responsive to the touch of culture, and this work has revealed a beautiful heroism and self-sacrifice, both on the part of the teachers in consecration to a noble work, and on the part of the pupils in their earnestness in seeking the advantages thus offered. Two special benefactions to this field deserve mention. One is the gift of $3 million by George Peabody in 1866, and the other that of one million dollars by John F. Slater of Norwich, Connecticut, in 1882. The treatment of the Indians by the United States is one of the darkest chapters in our national history. Mrs. Helen Hunt Jackson, who labored nobly in this cause, describes that whole history in one word, a century of dishonor. They were first robbed of their territories, then crowded into reservations, afterwards robbed of these, and all the time cheated, oppressed, and deceived. The only good Indian is a dead Indian, is the unholy dictum which has governed a great deal of our action. A humaner policy has, however, not been wanting. 
The first instruction delivered to Virginia was, quote, to provide that the true word and service of God be preached, planted, and used, not only in the said colony, but also as much as might be among the savages bordering upon it, according to the rites and doctrines of the Church of England, end quote. The point made by Roger Williams, that the Indian was the real owner of the soil, was acknowledged by many of the early colonists. The seal of Massachusetts colony had as its device the figure of an Indian, with the Macedonian cry, Come over and help us. But our coming has often been with no benevolent intentions. Recently a better spirit has been shown. The government is trying the work of civilization instead of extirpation, and with notable success. It supports many schools itself, besides aiding schools partially supported by missionary boards. The latter are called contract schools. For this class of work alone, the government distributed, in 1890, $506,994, of which the Catholics received 356491 the Presbyterians 47,650, the Congregational Society 16,408, and the remaining 86,455 was given to other church societies doing work among the Indians. The Indian Training School at Hampton, Virginia, has realized splendid results. Of the 250,000 Indians now in the United States, 96,000 are, wholly or in part, in citizen's dress, 22,000 can read, 29,000 can speak the English language, and 17,000 live in houses. In 1889, 300,000 acres of land were cultivated by the Indians. It seems evident, therefore, that the humaner policy has not been a failure. It is often asserted that the Indians are a doomed race, that they must eventually disappear from the earth. Whatever may be true of some tribes, it is a fact that there is an actual increase where tests have been applied. The Rev. Dr. J. P. Williamson, after a lifelong experience with the Dakotas, intimates that they have increased 60% in 40 years. The Rev. Dr. Stephen R. Riggs, after 40 years of service among the Sioux, in answer to the question, is the Indian dying out, said, No, sir, I do not think that the facts which are before us at all justify the belief that the Indians are necessarily a vanishing race. All the larger denominations support numerous hospitals, retreats, asylums, homes for the aged and infirm, and other institutions of mercy. The Roman Catholic Church has been prominent in this department of Christian activity, its numerous sisterhoods furnishing to its hand a body of workers adapted to the pursuits of charity. All the Protestant denominations have made notable advances within recent years, and have shown that they are not silent to the voice of distress. The work of Dorothea Lind Dix in improving the care of the insane is one of the most magnificent achievements of a century. What Howard did for prisons, Miss Dix has done for insane asylums. Her whole life was devoted to this cause, and through her efforts changes were introduced which tended to the permanent alleviation, if not cure, of the victims of insanity. Her work covered both continents. The life of this frail woman marked a new era in the history of human progress. It is impossible to do justice to the marvelous advance on all lines of social, industrial, and national enterprise due to the increasing Christian sentiment of the age. Societies for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children, organizations which do the same work for animals, the disappearance of dueling from every English-speaking land, arbitration for the settlement of national disputes, more considerate laws in war, the treatment of both civil and military prisoners, the crusade against opium and spirituous liquors, these and other facts show the growing power of Christian light and love. There are clouds, however, yet in our sky. There are occasional ebullitions of the old savage barbarism, 
There are problems of the most serious and perplexing character, such as intemperance and the conflict of labor and capital, which face the present generation. But the progress in the past fifty years has been so gratifying that we cannot but look to the future with great hope. Christian union is one of the most beautiful phrases of our American ecclesiastical life. It is only within recent years that fraternity has predominated over denominational differences. Theological controversies were so bitter, and men held to their convictions with such intense emphasis, that it was impossible for the churches to cooperate in the spirit of Christian love. The great revival of 1857-59 to helped to dissolve these animosities. The Evangelical Alliance, founded in 1846, has been a powerful agency in bringing the churches into closer relationship. The Young Men's Christian Association, founded in London by George Williams, June 6, 1844, attracted a great number of young men of all denominations into Christian work, and furnished a broad platform on which all churches could stand for the furtherance of the Redeemer's kingdom. The growth of this non-sectarian organization has been one of the golden fruits of this era. There were, in 1891, 4,110 associations throughout the world, with 375,163 members, of which number 1,341 associations were in the United States and Canada, with 212,676 members. The Sanitary and Christian Commissions were voluntary associations for the care of the wounded and suffering during the Civil War. These also strengthened the sentiment of Christian union. The needs of the unevangelized masses, the folly of intruding denominational rivalries into small communities in our own land, and in mission fields already occupied, the helplessness of a divided church before any great and urgent call, the scandal to the Christian name of the spirit of division which has had free course in many parts of the country, the perpetual object lesson of the Roman Catholic Church in the massiveness and unity of its impression, these and other considerations have helped forward the conviction that the time has come when some kind of a bond or federal union or alliance, some method of realizing an interdenominational fellowship, is imperatively demanded. The noble work of that best of all non-sectarian organizations, the American Bible Society, formed in 1816 in New York, a society which for nearly a century has been the meeting ground of Christians of every name, has shown that such a communion of labor and counsel is entirely practicable. The growth of Christian union has been also helped by the formation of the Young People's Society of Christian Endeavor, organized in Portland, Maine, by the Rev. Francis E. Clark in 1881. The Society emphasizes loyalty to one's own church as one of its cardinal principles, but it has interdenominational features which give it a unique and splendid advantage. This recent development of the Christian activity of America has had a marvelous growth in all evangelical denominations and has contributed towards the realization of the sense of Christian brotherhood and of the oneness of all of Christ's followers. The Protestant Episcopal Church has the honor of being the first to institute proceedings looking towards the reunion of Protestantism. In its general convention, held in Chicago in 1886, the House of Bishops submitted a plan by which it was thought the churches might take initial steps towards organic union. This basis was endorsed by the convention, and it has been submitted to the other Christian churches for their action. It puts forward the Apostles and the Nicene Creeds as an expression of doctrine, the Bible as the rule of faith, the sacraments of the Lord's Supper and Baptism, and the historic Episcopate. The overtures have received cordial welcome in many quarters, and in others only indifferent attention. The chief difficulty seems to be in the interpretation of the historic Episcopate. 
the consummation of some form of tangible and visible Christian union, is the great need of the modern church. But there is no likelihood that this fruition will ever be reached on the basis of any form of ecclesiastical polity. A declaration identical in terms with that of the House of Bishops of the Protestant Episcopal Church was set forth by the Conference of All the Bishops Throughout the World in Fellowship with the Church of England, held at the Lambeth Conference, London, in the summer of 1888. But the almost unanimous report of the Committee on Christian Union, appointed by the Chairman of this Conference, the Archbishop of Canterbury, in which the acceptance of the historic episcopate was interpreted as not necessarily invalidating the ordinations of other churches, was voted down by a large majority, and even its publication suppressed. End of chapter 25Part 5, Section 2, Chapter 26 of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 26, Missions. In no country has the growing missionary spirit been so strong as in the United States. In proportion to its brief history and the absorbing demands of its own territory, no land has achieved so much in foreign fields. The home field has indeed taken up the energies of the churches to a degree unparalleled elsewhere, yet this has stimulated to increased sacrifices for foreign missions. When we consider the work achieved in these two departments, it is impossible to charge the American church with indifference to the needs of the perishing. Reference has already been made to the work of Eliot and other missionaries to the Indians. During this century, the work has been carried forward with greater persistency. The Penobscot Indians of Maine have been under the charge of Catholic missionaries. Ravagna, who labored among them from 1800 to 1820, was one of the most devoted of the Catholic workers. In 1765, Samuel Kirkland opened up a Presbyterian mission among the Senecas in New York State. He then turned to the Oneidas, where he met with great success. The tribe was changed from savages to a sober, industrious, civilized Christian community. The Friends have also labored among the New York Indians during this century. The American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions, Congregational and Presbyterian from 1810 to 1870, Congregational since 1870, began their work in this field among the Cherokees of Georgia in 1815. One of their converts, a half-breed Cherokee, invented the Cherokee alphabet in 1825, and in three or four years half the nation could read. A remarkable fact in attestation of the good fruits of Indian missionary labor is that when in 1859 the Rev. H. H. Spaulding returned to the Nez Perce, after an enforced exile of twelve years, he found that these Indians had retained their religious services, and that many of them still kept up morning and evening prayers. In 1883, the American Board transferred all its Indian missions to the American Missionary Association. The Presbyterian Church entered this field in 1833. It has accomplished much in educational work. The Protestant Episcopal Church has paid special attention to the Sioux. The Rev. S. D. Hinman translated the prayer book into the Dakota tongue, and this church has established several successful agencies among intractable tribes. The Baptists have made a noble record. They have 162 churches and 21 missionaries in Indian Territory. John Stewart was the pioneer Methodist Indian missionary. His charge was the Wyandots of Ohio. He died in 1823. Many Methodist conferences have now their own missions among the Indians in all parts of the land. Two facts make missionary labor among the Indians particularly difficult, their extreme conservatism and their natural suspicion and jealousy of the whites, due to our century of dishonor. 
The Church of the United States has achieved great results in connection with missions in European and Asiatic Turkey. This has been especially an American field, and no part of the vast enterprise of modern missions has required greater wisdom and zeal. It was of the remarkable results of this mission that the Earl of Shaftesbury said, quote, I do not believe that in the whole history of missions, I do not believe that in the history of diplomacy or in the history of any negotiation carried on between man and man, we can find anything to equal the wisdom, the soundness, and the pure evangelical truth of the men who constitute the American mission. End quote. General Lew Wallace, who went to the East prejudiced against mission work in those countries, completely changed his views after a residence on the ground, and gave cheerful testimony to the fine work, both civilizing and religious, which the American missionaries are accomplishing. In 1863, Robert College was opened on the Bosphorus, and about the same time, the Syrian Protestant College at Beirut. These schools have been powerful factors in the uplifting of the country, and some of the missionaries, Drs. Hamlin, Long, Bliss, Washburn, Van Dyke, Post, and others, have blessed the whole world by their Oriental scholarship and sublime devotion to a great cause. Another triumph of the American missionary is the Sandwich Islands. In 1819, Bingham and Thurston arrived on the islands. In 1824, the principal chiefs agreed to recognize the Sabbath and adopt the Ten Commandments as the basis of government. The country has been long since completely Christianized, and in 1850 the native churches organized the Hawaiian Missionary Society to carry the gospel to other islands. To the American board belongs the honor of this marvelous history. In 1863, a greater proportion of the population could read and write than in New England. The results of this mission, however, have been severely endangered by the heavy ingress of foreign traders. This element has served as a most corrupting agency. Japan has also been a special field of American effort. The first to take advantage of the Treaty of 1858, in which certain ports were opened to trade and residence, July 4, 1859, was the Protestant Episcopal Church, which before the latter date had sent John Liggins and C. M. Williams, afterwards bishop, from China to Japan. The same year the Presbyterians sent Dr. J. C. Hepburn, the famous Japanese lexicographer, and the Reformed Church, the Rev. Dr. S. R. Brown, and two others. This was the beginning of that mighty impulse which has carried Japan to the van of Oriental nations intolerance, and the ideals of a Christian civilization. In 1868 occurred the Great Revolution, which overturned the old tycoon and brought in the reign of liberal ideas. In the magnificent progress of Christianity in Japan, the American churches have had a large share. Nearly all the denominations have representatives there. The societies laboring under the Presbyterial polity united in 1877 with the Native Church of Christ in Japan. The churches organized according to the congregational polity are independent Native churches. Efforts at further union have been made, but thus far unsuccessfully. The chief difficulty is in the line of discipline and polity. The Japanese themselves are impatient at what seems to them the frivolous divisions of the church. Quote, it is evident to all who are familiar with the history of the native intellect, or with the workings of the Japanese mind, past or present, that subtle doctrinal theories have no charm, but are only a weariness to the flesh. They refuse to believe that the hereditary quarrels of European Christians need to be perpetuated in their country, or that, in view of the gospel's supreme good news, and the necessities of their countrymen, either the denominational differences in doctrine or peculiarities of government are at all needful. End quote. In 1890, there were 18 Protestant churches operating in Japan, 
supporting 422 stations, 207 churches, and reporting 29,663 communicants. India is the virgin field of the American missionary movement. In 1806, four students at Williams College were accidentally driven together by a thunderstorm. Under the lee of a haystack, they pledged themselves to carry the gospel to the heathen, Samuel J. Mills saying, We can do it if we will. Two years later, Mills, Richards, and Gordon Hall signed a pledge to missionary work. Quote, in 1810, Mills, again leading, with Judson, Newell, and Knott, all students in Andover Theological Seminary, met a number of ministers at the parlor of Professor Stewart, and in response to their appeal to be sent to foreign lands, received the assurance, Go in the name of the Lord, and we will help. The next day, two of these ministers, Drs. Spring and Worcester, on their way to the General Association of Massachusetts, Congregational, at Bradford, formed the plan of the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions, which three days later, June 29, 1810, was adopted by the association. End quote. This is the oldest missionary society in the United States. On the 19th of February, 1812, Judson and Newell, with their wives, sailed from Salem, Massachusetts, for Calcutta, and on the 22nd, Hall, Rice, and Knott sailed from Philadelphia for the same port. This was the beginning at once of Christian foreign missions and of the heroic labors of American missionaries in Burma and India. The conversion of Judson to Baptist views brought the Baptists to India. The Presbyterians entered in 1833, the Methodists in 1856, and now there are about 14 American churches working in India. It is impossible to name all the lands where the feet of the American missionary have trod. The latest accession to Africa is the brave William Taylor, a man of apostolic mold. He has gone into the Congo country, and we trust will aid mightily towards founding a Christian state. The first Methodist foreign missionary was Melville B. Cox, whose early death in Liberia, in 1833, left the memory of a beautiful and devoted life. Korea is one of the latest on the list of missions. The Rev. John Ross, of Moncton, China, without leaving his own mission, mastered the Korean language, translated the whole New Testament into Korean, sent packages into the country, and thus, when Protestant missionaries at a later time entered Korea, quote, they found whole communities in the north professing Protestant Christianity, studying the Bible among themselves, and only waiting for someone to come and teach them, end quote. In 1884, the Presbyterian and Methodist Episcopal boards almost simultaneously sent missionaries into the country. Alaska, long shamefully neglected, is now the center of a promising mission. The Rev. Dr. Sheldon Jackson, the Apostle of Alaska, has placed the whole Christian church under obligation to him for his labors in that new and needy field. He is an honor to the Presbyterian Church. No more important mission field demands the consecration of Christian sympathy and energy than the United States. Immigration on a scale unknown in modern history has placed upon us problems which are the despair of our wisest men. Quote, Wide open and unguarded stand our gates, and through them presses a wild motley throng, men from the Volga and the Tartar steppes, featureless figures of the Hoang Ho, Malaysian, Scythian, Teuton, Celt, and Slav, flying the old world's poverty and scorn. These bringing with them unknown gods and rites, those, tiger passions, here to stretch their claws. In street and alley, what strange tongues are these, accents of menace, alien to our air, voices that once the Tower of Babel knew. O liberty, white goddess, is it well to leave the gates unguarded? On thy breast fold sorrow's children, soothe the hurts of fate, 
lift the downtrodden, but with hand of steel stay those who to thy sacred portals come to waste the gifts of freedom. Have a care, lest from thy brow the clustered stars be torn and trampled in the dust. For so of old the thronging goth and vandal trampled Rome, and where the templets of the Caesars stood, the lean wolf unmolested made her lair. End quote. Footnote. Thomas Bailey Aldrich, in the Atlantic Monthly, August 1892. End footnote. The first home missionary society was organized by the Congregationalists in Connecticut in 1774. The Presbyterians of New York and New Jersey followed in 1789 and 1796, and the Congregationalists of Massachusetts established the Massachusetts Home Missionary Society in 1799. The polity of the Methodist Episcopal Church, requiring an itinerant ministry, the labors of many of its preachers were purely missionary, without the name. The Western Field was one of great territory for home missionary work. The Methodist Episcopal Missionary Society was organized in 1819, but its labors for the first thirteen years were confined entirely to the home field. All the churches exhibited a profound interest in missionary work. The Protestant Episcopal Church organized its board of missions for both foreign and home work in 1820. The Baptists established their home missionary society in 1832. Some of the churches have women's home missionary societies, which supplement, in a wise and successful way, the regular work of the churches with which they are connected. The field which these latter societies have chosen has been chiefly in the South, on the frontier, and especially in Utah. The American Home Missionary Society was formed in 1826. It is mainly supported by the Congregationalists, as is also the American Missionary Association. The work of these and other societies in our own land is one of the most promising and important which can engage the attention of our people. Our national history thus far has been more or less of an experiment. It is for the churches to say whether, in the very highest and largest sense, the Republic of the United States shall prove a success and its liberty shall continue to enlighten the world. End of chapter 26 Part 5, Section 2, Chapter 27 of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 27, The Sunday School As in England, so in America, efforts were put forth for the religious instruction of children entirely independent of the work of Rakes in 1780, from which the Sunday school, as an organized institution, takes its rise. As early as 1641, the General Court of Massachusetts Colony provided for catechizing the children. The scriptures were memorized with great assiduity. There is historic proof of a number of Sunday school beginnings. In Roxbury, Massachusetts, in 1674, two years later in Norwich, Connecticut, in Plymouth, Massachusetts in 1680, in Newtown, Long Island in 1683, by the Schwenkfelders in Berks and Montgomery Counties, Pennsylvania in 1734, in Ephrata, Pennsylvania by Ludwig Hawker in 1740, quote, a school continuing for thirty years with gratuitous instruction, children's meetings, and having many revivals, end quote. In Bethlehem, Connecticut, by Rev. Joseph Bellamy in 1740, in Philadelphia, by Mrs. Greening in 1744, in Columbia, Connecticut, by Rev. Eliezer Wheelock in 1763, and in 1786, by Bishop Asbury at the House of Thomas Crenshaw in Hanover County, Virginia. After 1790, many schools sprang up. In January 1791, the First Day, or Sunday School Society, was formed in Philadelphia 
to secure the religious instruction of poor children on Sunday. These schools were isolated instances, and it cannot be said that any one of them was the original of the American Sunday School. Since the beginning of the 19th century, the Sunday School in America has enjoyed a remarkable growth. In no part of the world has it possessed such an hospitable field. The visit of Mrs. Bethune and Mrs. Graham, earnest Sunday school workers, to England about 1803, and the visit of Rev. Robert May of London to America in 1811, gave the cause a permanent growth. May was an enthusiastic believer in Sunday schools, and he suggested many improved methods. Sunday school unions were organized in New York and Boston in 1816, and in Philadelphia in 1817. Out of these grew the American Sunday School Union in 1824. This is an undenominational society, and it has been of incalculable service to the cause both as a missionary and a publishing organization. In 1826, the Methodist Episcopal Church formed its own Sunday School Union, and the other denominations have also taken the work into their own hands. The agent of the Sunday School Union is often one of the first representatives of Christianity to set foot in many a pioneer settlement, and the Sunday school he organizes is invariably the nucleus of the coming church. In 1889, at the World's Sunday School Convention in London, the following statistics were reported for the United States. Sunday schools, 101,824. Teachers, 1,100,104. Scholars, 8,345,431. Total membership, 9,445,535. The membership must be now nearly 10 millions. A large part of early Sunday school instruction was in the elementary English branches. By and by, with the development of the common schools, religious instruction came more and more to the front. Often, and that to the present day in some parts of the country, instruction in the alphabet and elementary reader and in the Bible proceeded side by side. James Gall, in his End and Essence of Sabbath School Teaching and his Nature's Normal School, aimed to introduce an improved lesson system into Scotland, which was also used in some schools in America as early as 1820. Stowe's training system, giving prominence to pictorial methods of instruction, aided in reforming the excessive use of the memory. A thorough advance in America was effected by the introduction of the Uniform Limited Lessons, prepared in 1825, and adopted by the American Sunday School Union and its hundreds of auxiliaries in 1826. This scheme contemplated a five years course of study for the whole Bible, one and the same lesson for all, of from seven to fifteen verses, questions and comments, in at least three grades, and reviews. This was really a revolution in Sunday School methods. At once, the institution assumed an importance never approached before. In 1840, the London Sunday School Union adopted a similar scheme. Mimpris introduced in England in 1844 an excellent method for the study of the Gospels in a graduated simultaneous series, which was republished in this country and exerted a considerable influence. In 1871, a meeting of Sunday School Publishers in New York, at the request of the Executive Committee of the National Sunday School Convention, agreed upon a scheme of lessons for 1872. Quote, at the Indianapolis Convention in that year, a lesson committee was appointed to arrange a course of lessons for seven years, covering the whole Bible, and which was recommended for the use of the Sunday schools throughout the country. End quote. This excellent plan was adopted in 1873. The same system, now called the International System of Sunday School Lessons, has contributed more towards Bible study than all other agencies combined. Conventions, teachers' meetings, 
normal classes, and other auxiliary means have helped to perfect the Sunday school idea. A rich literature has grown up. The presses of all the churches have furnished for the Sunday school library not only works in biography, history, travel, religion, adventure, and fiction, but they have also given admirable and scholarly works for the understanding of the Bible. End of chapter 27、five, section two, chapter of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 28 Christian Literature Elementary religious works were produced at an early period. The New England Primer, during the 18th century, was the little manual which was regarded in New England as necessary for every child's instruction. The catechism prepared by Richard Mather and John Cotton, entitled Spiritual Milk for Babes, appeared in many forms and for many years, and was incorporated into the New England primer of later date. It was made a part of a primer for the colony of Connecticut, and published about 1715. The New England primer absorbed the necessary parts of other elementary works, and was published in the various colonies. It was edited by many competent hands, and adapted itself to the political changes of the colonies. At one time it was strongly anti-Catholic. It was loyal to the British king when it was necessary so to be. But in due time it produced Washington's portrait as its frontispiece. The New England primer improved was the later and final form. It contained hymns by Watts, easy spelling and reading lessons, prayers, acrostics, the shorter catechism, and the celebrated Dialogue Between Christ, Youth, and the Devil. The picture of John Rogers at the stake, surrounded by his wife and children, was always a necessary illustration. The alphabetic couplets beginning with, In Adam's fall we sinned all, and closing with, Zacchaeus he did climb the tree his lord to see, were never omitted, as needful exposition of the truth to accompany the quaint illustrations. The Psalterium Americanum, edited by Cotton Mather, was used for worship extensively. The whole Book of Psalms, published in 1640, and the first English book printed in the Western Hemisphere, was a literal reprint of the received version. It was as near an approach to the Psalter of the established church as the antipathies of the Puritan fathers would allow. The great basis of the New England faith was the Westminster Catechism. It was the universal guide. Each pastor in the colonial period proceeded according to its requirements. It was regarded as the great modern triumph of Christianity in Europe. Sermons were preached upon it, and books were published in exposition of it. Samuel Willard, for example, covered a space of nineteen years, By delivering two hundred and fifty lectures on the shorter catechism. His works were published after his death in a ponderous volume, the first folio produced by the American press. Sermons were a favorite form of religious literature. Watts's Psalms and Hymns went through numerous editions. Religious biography, such as the Journal of Whitefield and others, was in general demand. Reprints of Baxter's practical works were common. Only a short time elapsed before a good practical work in England found its way to Boston and came out from the press of Neeland, Bumstead, or some other printer of that place. The fruits of the colonial press now appear exceedingly primitive, but they formed an essential part of the religious foundation of the country. And proved to us the early determination of the colonists to develop a religious literature independent of the mother country. The religious literature of the recent period has taken on a more popular character. To no one writer is America indebted more than to Jacob Abbott for the power of religion over the popular mind. After leaving the Elliott Congregational Church in Roxbury, Massachusetts, 
in 1836, of which he was pastor for two years, he devoted his whole time to the writing of religious books. These have had an enormous sale. He made religion attractive and inaugurated a new era in the treatment of such themes. As soon as the Sunday school began to use the circulating library, a demand arose for a literature that would combine fascinating interest with pure moral instruction. This demand has been abundantly supplied in a Sunday school literature the most captivating in the world. Writers like Daniel Wise, Edward Everett Hale, Richard Newton, Mrs. A. D. T. Whitney, Julia A. Eastman, and Pansy, Mrs. G. R. Alden, have furnished the present generation with religious books of unparalleled interest and power. Some of the works of Newton have been translated into twenty languages. The most recent phase of this subject is the popularity of books of scholarly and thoughtful caste. Volumes of sermons and other discussions in religion by vigorous and progressive thinkers, who are heartily in sympathy with historic Christianity, pass through many editions in a few years. The best preachers command a vast audience through their books and the weekly publication of their sermons. Religious newspapers and magazines have a wide circulation, which is constantly increasing. Judging from the sale of books, there never was so much popular interest in religion as at present. In no country has the religious press so prominent a place as in the United States, and that place is richly deserved by superior merit. Thomas Prince, 1722-48, to son of the famous pastor of the Old South Church, published the first American periodical. It was called The Christian History, containing accounts of the revival and propagation of religion in Great Britain and America for 1743, Boston, 1744-45, to two volumes. It was published weekly. The Connecticut Evangelical Magazine began in 1800 in Hartford and continued ten years. The Massachusetts Missionary Magazine began in Boston in 1803. The Panoplist, begun in 1805, was merged into it in 1808. The name was changed to that of Missionary Herald in 1822, and under that familiar name the magazine has continued to the present time. Other religious and theological magazines and quarterlies followed. The first of the present religious newspapers was the Congregationalist, which began under the title of The Boston Recorder, January 3, 1816. The next in order of time were The Religious Intelligencer in 1816, The Watchman in 1819, The Christian Mirror in 1822, Zion's Herald in 1823, New York Observer in 1823, The Christian Advocate in 1826, The Morning Star in 1826. Many other great denominational papers followed in quick succession. In the Chautauqua Literary and Scientific Circle, the reading habit has found one of its most stimulating incitements. This movement originated in an assembly held at Chautauqua Lake, New York, in 1874. It has rapidly developed into an annual institution and continues its immense influence through the year by a reading course. The varied courses of studies, lectures, and readings have been enjoyed by thousands every year, and the number visiting Chautauqua for these purposes is rapidly multiplying. Such work has brought new life and light to many homes, and by the communion of delightful studies has brightened the dull routine of daily toil. Bishop John H. Vincent and the Honorable Lewis Miller were the originators of the Chautauqua movement. President Harper of the University of Chicago is the principal of its varied schools. From the day of the Bay Psalm Book and Wigglesworth's Day of Doom to the verse of Ray Palmer is a history fraught with notable achievements in Christian song. America has contributed her share to the general chorus. The more notable of our hymn writers 
have been recognized by the whole Christian world. Timothy Dwight, died 1817, the president of Yale College, was a renowned theologian in his time, but he is now known most of all for his hymn, which is sung the world over, I Love Thy Kingdom, Lord. Samuel Davies, died 1761, one of the most eloquent and powerful preachers of the American church, wrote, Lord, I am thine, entirely thine. James Waddell Alexander, died 1859, of princely origin, was happy in his translation of German hymns. The old passion hymn, O Sacred Head Now Wounded, is the best known. Bishop George W. Doan, died 1859, wrote, Softly Now the Light of Day. His brethren in the Episcopal Church, Bishop Henry W. Onderdonk and William Augustus Muhlenberg, have also produced some masterpieces. The latter, who died in 1877, was a man of saintly life and of noble influence on the Christian life and thought of his time. His hymns, like Noah's Weary Dove and I Would Not Live Alway, will long continue to express the sentiments of innumerable souls until the discords of earth are lost in the harmonies of the Song of Moses and the Lamb. The poet Bryant is known by several hymns found in all the hymnals, and John Pierpont has given us, O Thou to Whom in Ancient Times, and The Winds Are Hushed, The Peaceful Moon. Phoebe Carey wrote many sweet lyrics of trust and hope. Her best-known hymn is One Sweetly Solemn Thought. William B. Tappan, died 1849, was an industrious poet. His There is an hour of peaceful rest and Tis midnight and on olive's brow are familiar to Christians in all parts of the world. Augustus L. Hillhouse, died 1859, wrote one of the grandest poems in the English language, Trembling Before Thine Awful Throne. Edward H. Sears, author of one of the best studies of John's Gospel, The Fourth Gospel, The Heart of Christ, gave us two inspiring Christmas hymns, Calm on the Listening Ear of Night, and It Came Upon the Midnight Clear. Bishop Arthur Cleveland Cox is the author of Oh, Where Are Kings and Empires Now? How Beauteous Are the Marks Divine? and In the Silent Midnight Watches. Ray Palmer, died 1887, stands at the head of all our American hymn writers, and by the side of the immortal masters of universal Christian song. Some of his hymns are perfect. Like the best of Wesley's and Watts and Top Ladies, they seem the fruit of a divine inspiration. They are exquisite in form, and breathe the majestic spirit of Christian faith and the profound humility of Christian devotion. All of our great poets have contributed to our hymnology. Longfellow, Whittier, Bryant, Holmes, have written single lyrics which greatly enrich the sacred poetry of the church universal. End of chapter 28。Part 5, Section 2, Chapter 29 of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 29, The American Pulpit. The American pulpit has occupied a large place in the religious history of the country. The first preachers were men of remarkable gifts. Thoroughly educated, for the most part in Cambridge, England, devoted to Bible study and to the investigation of the severest theological problems, active in temporal affairs, the first ministers of the colonies made their influence felt on the whole life of the country. This was particularly true of New England, where the clergy had a fair field. They were the real founders of the New England commonwealths. In their fast day and Thanksgiving Day discourses, they discussed public questions with great ability and perfect frankness. The legislators derived their best advice from the ministers, who never avoided the full and just treatment of great public questions. They were the chief promoters of every educational movement. 
they founded the early colleges. They knew their power. They magnified their office. No Stuart King was reverenced more by ardent loyalist than the New England minister by his flock. But in this case no men were more worthy of that reverence. As Professor Moses Coit Taylor says, quote, For once in the history of the world, the sovereign power was in the hands of sovereign men. End quote. In holiness of life, in intellectual breadth and acuteness, in devotion to their calling, they were a body of men unsurpassed in the history of the founding of great commonwealths. Their support was often scanty, a piece of land and a few hundred dollars. They were often paid in produce. Poor in all things except the wealth of brains and faith, the preachers of the colonial period of America have made many rich. The New England sermon, until quite a late period, was a magnificent specimen of intellectual athletics. The deepest problems of religion were ventilated with a completeness and logical thoroughness of which the preaching at this age can give us but little conception. If one sermon was insufficient for this purpose, the subject was continued the next Sunday. Indeed, it might run through the year or the years. Doctrinal preaching was largely in vogue. Abstract points of metaphysical theology were then living questions in which the people were intensely interested. Mrs. Harriet Beecher Stowe, as one to the manner born, has interpreted the New England mind in her minister's wooing. She there represents the men and matrons of the age succeeding the Revolution as discussing over their work the theology of the long, abstruse sermons of the preceding Sabbath. They entered into these debates with keen relish. The pulpit was the sole fountain of popular instruction. Happily enough, it was not then confronted with the many rivals which now contest its influence. The preachers rose to their opportunities, and from their high vantage ground they spoke with power and authority. They were the uncrowned kings of the age. The pulpit was the only throne known to the colonies. In the past more than today, the American clergy have been the leaders in all movements for liberty and the better time. In the war for independence, they thundered from their pulpits against English oppression, and aroused the people to enthusiasm. Both in the North and South, the clergy were heroes on the field and in council, and were among the first to foresee the necessity of revolution and the sublime destiny of the country. Without the clergy of that critical time, the independence of the United States could not have been achieved. The same fact appears in the Civil War of 1861-65. to In the gradual development of the spirit of emancipation of the slaves, the clergy performed their full share. Many of them, indeed, were conservative and took no active part in the discussions. Others spoke out boldly. Samuel Hopkins, in Newport, lifted up his voice against the slave trade, then actively conducted by New England dealers. He was fierce in his attacks, even though some members of his congregation were engaged in the business. He devised a scheme of colonization by which he hoped to solve the problem. Theodore Parker was a mighty champion in the same cause. Henry Ward Beecher told the members of his church in Brooklyn, on becoming their pastor, that he expected to wage war against slavery, and that he desired a free field. Many less influential were no less outspoken. The temperance reform has called out the earnest efforts of the clergy. Justin Edwards devoted his life to this cause. Hitchcock at Amherst and Beecher at Litchfield were sturdy champions. If to some the ministry did not move fast enough along lines of reform, it can be said that the adherence of the clergy has made this and every other beneficent movement possible. Many of the American clergy have been famous for the quickening power of their preaching. Great revivals and organized movements have been prompted by their appeals. Edward N. Kirk, of the Mount Vernon Congregational Church, Boston, 
exercised a most fruitful ministry. Asahel Nettleton was active as an evangelist in Massachusetts, Connecticut, and New York from 1812 to 1822. He was a strong Calvinist and vigorously opposed the methods and doctrines of Finney. Finney himself labored with marvelous success in evangelistic work from 1824 to 1860. Even after his installation as professor at Oberlin in 1835, he traveled through the country on his revival mission. He used simple language, was clear, logical, and direct in his presentation of the truth. He analyzed the motives with a master hand, and his appeals to the conscience were overwhelming. Both his preaching and methods were similar to those already employed by the Methodists, and for a time he was bitterly opposed by some Congregational and Presbyterian ministers. These conservatives held a convention in New Lebanon, New Hampshire, to decide what to do concerning Finney's innovations. Lyman Beecher, though progressive enough in some matters, was among Finney's opponents. Beecher was a powerful preacher, and his own labors were not without permanent results in the quickening of the churches. Benjamin Abbott carried on a marvelous ministry in New Jersey in the second and third decades of the 19th century. He was the founder of many Methodist churches in that state. Peter Cartwright, the Methodist pioneer in the West, was a man of original mold with a strong dash of eccentricity. The preaching of him and of many of his co-laborers was attended with remarkable demonstrations. The days of Pentecost were repeated. Cartwright received over 10,000 people into the church. The Revue des Deux Mondes, in a full treatment of his career, has presented Cartwright's work as a type of the pioneer religious life of the United States. His life reads like a romance. Recently, under Moody and other evangelists, revivals on a large scale have been witnessed. Many eminent preachers have shed honor upon the American church. In no field of our ecclesiastical life has there been reaped a richer or more enduring harvest. In these later times, the following, among others, deserve mention. Edward Payson was a man of preeminent holiness and purity of character. He was the pastor of the Second Congregational Church of Portland, Maine, from 1807 until his death in 1827. It has been said that his life and sermons have been, quote, more read at home and abroad than the writings of any other New England divine except Timothy Dwight, end quote. John Summerfield was an Englishman, who, in 1821, entered the Methodist ministry in New York. His career was brief, but it was one of remarkable brilliancy and success. He drew vast crowds by his astonishing eloquence. Henry B. Bascom, of the Methodist Episcopal Church, South, who died in Louisville in 1850, had a national reputation as a preacher. Horace Bushnell, of Hartford, died 1876, was the Frederick William Robertson of America. His sermons were bold and original, and remarkably suggestive in their unfolding and application of spiritual truth. Henry Ward Beecher was an important name in the history of American preaching. He was the son of Lyman Beecher, and began his ministry at Lawrenceburg, Indiana, in 1837, whence in two years he was called to Indianapolis. From 1847 until his death, March 8, 1887, he was the pastor of Plymouth Church, Brooklyn, where he achieved a worldwide reputation. His frankness and unconventionality, his warm human sympathies, and his intrepid advocacy of every moral reform, his marvelous insight into certain aspects of the gospel and of the character of Christ, the sweep of his imagination and his splendid oratorical gifts, all these things gave him a phenomenal success as a preacher. He cared nothing for theology as a system. Indeed, he had little theological ability. His mind was not logical and constructive, but intuitional. He had a great heart, 
and the supreme object of his ministry was human helpfulness. His long ministry of forty years in Brooklyn is the most famous, perhaps, in the annals of church history. It may be fitly compared, because of fervid eloquence, combative force against popular errors, and lengthy continuance, to the immortal career of Chrysostom in Antioch and Constantinople. Matthew Simpson was one of the most powerful and magnetic preachers of the American church. With a vivid imagination, a far-reaching and melodious voice, a keen perception of the very central truths of the gospel, an intense sympathy with the masses, and a powerful and subtle grasp of the need of great reforms, he long stood as leader of the Methodist Episcopal Church, in council, on the platform, and in the pulpit. In lofty and overpowering speech, Bishop Simpson takes just rank among the most eloquent preachers of the Anglo-Saxon pulpit. Many other names occur in the history of American preaching. James L. Hawks, John McClintock, Thomas Gard, William Adams, John P. Thompson, Edwin H. Chapin, William R. Williams, George W. Bethune, Thomas Starr King, James Freeman Clark, Otis H. Tiffany. These names represent many more who have shown that in the matter of preaching, the United States has been behind no country in the world. End of chapter 29「Chapter thirty of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty Theology of the American Church. The early American theology was serious and fundamental. The doctrinal differences of the old world had caused the Puritan emigration. The thinking revolved about the foundations of Christianity. Never was so much theological meditation, fortified by appropriate scripture proofs, produced amid such humble surroundings as in our early New England colonies. The echoes from the Westminster Assembly were heard throughout New England, and produced their effect in the log house of the humblest colony. Theological terms were well understood, and the finer points had their discriminating judges in men clad in homespun. The Bible was uppermost in every mind. A doctrinal tenet, which was purely speculative and had no direct scriptural proof, passed as of little value. The Westminster Catechism, the Savoy Confession, and the Thirty-Nine Articles of the Church of England were the universal bases of belief. These were claimed to be derived directly from the Bible, and stood next to it in the love of the people. The scriptures were read daily in the domestic circle, and often the head of the family used the original Hebrew and Greek. Scriptural themes were frequent in academic use. Cotton Mather's address, on taking his degree as Bachelor of Arts, was based on the divinity of the Hebrew points. We record says an author, quote, at our country's origin, a favorable impulse to the employment of our native good sense in theological investigation. For our fathers made an open renunciation of all prescriptive systems, and took the Bible alone for their textbook, end quote. The liberalizing period came as a result of the introduction of the halfway covenant. Many persons coming into the church without profession of regeneration, a large amount of loose theology came with them. Less attention was given to the confessions. The Bible was regarded as of less importance than in the earlier time. Many people looked upon the severer thinking of their fathers as good enough for the beginning of colonial life, but not suited to the more advanced period. The reaction against the scriptural letter opened wide the door for a too liberal theological tendency. The result was the Unitarian revolt. The controversial period was the next stage in our theology. While the great revival at the middle of the 18th century did much to restore the old theological firmness, the tendency now was to a discussion of great scriptural themes. 
Jonathan Edwards, of Northampton, by his work on The Freedom of the Will, opened the door to a line of controversy which has broken out afresh at intervals ever since. His work was the best philosophical structure ever reared on the Calvinistic theology, whether in the old world or the new. The Congregationalists were most affected by this controversy. While the Presbyterians were agitated by the discussion, they were never diverted from a line which they early chose, the literary qualifications of their ministry, a thorough Christian experience, and a zeal in occupying new territory. The favorite theological textbooks of the pre-revolutionary period had been Ames's Medulla, Wolleb's Compendium, and Willard's Body of Divinity. But some other works came in to take their place. The writings of Edwards, who is the real founder of New England theology, took the place of these primitive works. The three authors who built on the Edwardian foundation were Bellamy, in his True Religion, Smalley, in his Distinction Between Natural and Moral Inability, and Hopkins, in his Reduction of Disinterested Love to a System of Theology. The Hopkinsian theology was a toning down of the strict Calvinism of Edwards and his school. The leaders were Hopkins, Bellamy, the younger Edwards, West, Spring, and Emmons. They differed from the elder Calvinism as to the nature of human depravity, the imputation of Adam's sin, the nature and extent of the atonement, and the natural inability of the unregenerate to become Christians. They were warm advocates of revivals, benevolent institutions, and missionary movements, and they founded the Theological Magazine, New York, the Evangelical Magazine, Connecticut, and the Missionary Magazine, Massachusetts. The strict Edwardian Calvinists and the Hopkinsians were two distinct classes at the beginning of the present century. Each operated on the other favorably. In due time they approached and amalgamated, though without any formal action. The union of the Calvinistic Panoplist with the Hopkinsian Missionary Magazine in 1808 was one of the public evidences of the amalgamation. Leonard Woods of Andover was a judicious and moderate theologian who stood squarely on Calvinistic principles without pushing them to an extreme. Nathaniel Emmons of Franklin, Massachusetts, carried still further Hopkins's liberalizing of Edwards. He emphasized the freedom of the will and free volition as essential to every good or bad act. He rejected the transference of Christ's righteousness. The influence of this godly and venerable pastor and theologian was most profound on later New England thought. Nathaniel W. Taylor, of the Divinity School of Yale College, sought to relieve the Calvinistic doctrine of sin of its difficulties. His theological lectures and works created widespread consternation among the more conservative, and led to the formation of the East Windsor, Connecticut, Theological School, under Bennett Taylor, his bitter opponent. This institution has developed into the present Hartford Theological Seminary. Edwards A. Park, the pupil of Emmons, was the Nathaniel W. Taylor of Andover. He was a teacher of great intellectual acuteness and breadth, and completely emancipated the congregational theology from the last remnant of strict Calvinism. The quickening power of his influence on multitudes of pupils who have carried his theological method further than the master is one of the most notable facts in the recent history of the Church. The present Andover theology is in the direct line of this development. It is due to the extension of the idea of the universal atonement of Christ. The recent trial of the Andover professors for heresy under the seminary creed has been decided by the Supreme Court of Massachusetts, though on another and technical issue, in favor of the professors. The Unitarian development arose as a protest against the old Calvinism, and was fostered by the intellectual atmosphere of New England and the decline of spiritual religion. 
it has recently thrown out many of those positive elements which linked it to historic Christianity. Some of its representatives have adopted the extreme of German rationalism, while others adhere to the borderland of the Orthodox faith. The Presbyterian Church has gone through a similar experience with the Congregational. It has been helpless to prevent the disintegration of the severer creeds of the post-Reformation age. The old school fought tenaciously for the traditional conceptions, but at the reunion of the Church in 1870, the new school obtained complete recognition. It was the ruling school in the North. Henry B. Smith, professor in the Union Theological Seminary, New York, from 1850 until his resignation on account of ill health in 1874, was the real father of the most modern and aggressive Presbyterian theology. The notable personality of this devout scholar and theologian is one of the rare heritages of the American Church. The Hodges, of Princeton, were able champions of the old school. At present, Princeton stands as the representative of the strict orthodoxy of the Presbyterian Church. In the Union Theological Seminary, Professor Charles A. Briggs, the pupil and follower of Henry B. Smith, is under trial for heresy. The partnership between Princeton and Union in the conduct of a most able and admirable theological periodical, the Presbyterian Review, 1880-89, was dissolved. A revision of the Westminster Confession has been undertaken, which is proceeding on very conservative lines. The present outlook is that the younger and more progressive thinkers, the pupils of Smith, Schaff, and Hitchcock, and like-minded theologians, will yet occupy hospitable places in their ancestral home. The Irenical period is the latest stage in American theology. While each of the great religious denominations has its theological system and has developed its systematic theology from the basis of its confession, there has been a notable absence of the polemic spirit. The Edwardian theory of the will has been ably answered by Wedden, from an American point of view, but without acrimony. The universal tendency now is, in treating doctrinal theology, not to pull down another, but to build up one's own system. Everywhere the spirit is constructive. In spite of appearances that indicate the contrary, the animus of theology at present is peaceful and mediatory. The purpose is more and more to emphasize the great underlying truths on which all churches stand, and to free the evangelical faith from embarrassing and unnecessary inferences and additions. The reconciling influence of Arminian theology, which at the beginning of the 19th century was dreaded as a dangerous importation, has been most salutary. But there are many factors which have contributed towards a larger tolerance and a more generous Catholicity. The churches are uniting on a basis of the fundamental doctrines of Christ to carry on an aggressive campaign against the kingdom of darkness. The points of disagreement are seen to be comparatively few and minor. The true growth of the church, both in spiritual power and in the respect and homage of men, is found to be not only consistent with the free expression of individual opinion and the untrammeled development of theology, but to require such freedom of expression and development. The essential doctrines of the gospel were never more cordially believed than is the case today. The American Church is more and more inclined to settle down on the cardinal truths of Christianity, and, without laying again the foundations, or compromising any of the essentials of belief, to go forward to meet the great questions which humanity has too long been asking, but in vain. End of chapter 30Part 5, Section 2, Chapter 31 of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 31, Theological Scholarship The contributions of the American Church to theological science, 
even from the early colonial period, have been important. The development of biblical scholarship has been very rapid, especially within the last hundred years. Moses Stewart of Andover was the most notable of the early interpreters of the sacred text, and so far surpassed all predecessors, that he may be called the father of biblical literature in America. He was the first to bring to his task as an exegete the requisite first-hand knowledge, and to inspire others with his enthusiasm for scholarship. His name in this respect is the most eminent of any in the history of our land. He broke the ground in 1813 by a Hebrew grammar, and he continued until he died January 4, 1852. His last book, A Commentary on the Book of Proverbs, was published in that year. When he printed his Hebrew grammar, he was compelled to set up the types of about half the paradigms of the verbs with his own hands. He was the pioneer also in introducing German theological works into this country. He here achieved a great triumph in overcoming a deep prejudice, but he conferred a lasting boon on American students for all time to come in opening to them the wealth of the evangelical learning of Germany. He was himself an expositor of the Bible, of rare insight and judgment. Contemporaneous with him was Samuel H. Turner, professor of the General Theological Seminary, Episcopal, New York, from 1818 until his death in 1861. He also shared with Stuart the opprobrium of translating German works on the Bible, and published original commentaries and other works. Turner was an earnest scholar and a sound commentator, and he achieved much for American biblical scholarship. Edward Robinson was the third member of this illustrious trio of pioneers. In 1823, he assisted his friend and colleague, Professor Stewart, in getting out a second edition of the latter's Hebrew grammar. His life was devoted to his science. His greatest work was his Biblical Researches in Palestine, Mount Sinai, and Arabia Petraea, the first edition of which was published in 1841. It was the first attempt in modern times to open up the Bible lands after thorough and patient exploration. It was a monumental work, and all the later books on the Bible have drawn from it as from a fountain. William M. Thompson, in The Land and the Book, shows how the lands of the Bible, as seen today, confirm the scriptural narrative. Andrews Norton, who taught sacred literature in Harvard from 1813 to 1830, was also an early worker in the biblical field. His great work on The Genuineness of the Gospels was published in Boston, 1837 to 44. He is the Lardner of America. Coming down to later times, we name only representatives of a large class of biblical scholars. Ezra Abbott, a textual critic of worldwide reputation, author of an invaluable monograph on the external evidences of the fourth gospel. Caspar René Gregory, whom Abbott assisted in the publication of the Prolegomena to the Eighth Larger Edition of Tischendorf's Greek Testament. Horatio B. Hackett, one of the noblest Christian scholars of modern times, whose Commentary and Acts is a work of exceptional value, and who, with Abbott, assisted in editing the American edition of Smith's Bible Dictionary. Thomas J. Conant, the learned and patient translator of the Bible for the American Bible Union. Joseph Addison Alexander, a man of vast learning, who at Princeton helped Stuart of Andover in popularizing German biblical scholarship, but, like Stuart, was also an independent explorer. Fallis H. Newhall, a brilliant scholar. Henry J. Ripley, whose life connects the early and later period. Enoch C. Wines, famous in another department of labor, whose Commentaries on the Laws of the Ancient Hebrews has established his reputation in this department. George R. Noyes, one of the older commentators, an accurate and reverent translator. 
Charles Hodge, Daniel D. Wedden, James Strong, and William Nast, who have done honor to the Universal Church by their priceless labors in the field of biblical science. In historical theology, there has been an excellent beginning. America being far removed from the conflicts and prejudices of the old world, there is no reason why there should not here prevail the judicial spirit. Some of our young American scholars in general history, beginning their historical studies in the German universities, have transplanted to our shores at once the pure historical spirit and the rare historical fruits of the long and calm investigation of German historians. America preceded England as the discoverer of the historical treasures of Germany. Bancroft, Motley, and others of our young men feasted their eyes upon the stores of historical wealth in Göttingen. They only prepared the way for a great habit, the American study of history in Germany and a sustained familiarity with the latest historical literature of the continent in general. This early drinking at the German fountains of history applies also to historical theology. George P. Fisher of Yale was a student in Halle, and without his German training there had not been his superb histories, which have appeared during the last two decades. Henry B. Smith's edition of Hagenbach's History of Christian Doctrines is a masterpiece of scholarship. The same great scholar revised and completed Geisler's History of the Church and wrote himself a History of the Church in Sixteen Chronological Tables. Philip Schaff is the greatest of all our church historians. A native of Switzerland and a student under the noble and pure Neander, he came to this country when a young man and has devoted his life to teaching and authorship. There is hardly a department of theological science which he has not made richer by his labors. But it is as an historian of the church that his scholarship has been most important and his fame most enduring. His example has been an inspiration to many young men who will enrich the historiography of the church of the future. Lyman Coleman has investigated Christian antiquities, and Charles W. Bennett has given us the best single work on Christian archaeology. Charles W. Baird and his brother Henry M. Baird have made thorough studies of the Huguenot emigration to America and their father, Robert Baird, was the first to give a connected historical account of religion in America. Dorchester has produced a History of Christianity in the United States, which is a storehouse of valuable facts. Leonard Bacon has written a History of the Origin of the New England Churches, entitled Genesis of the New England Churches. Henry M. Dexter was an accomplished student of Puritan history, and his works are of great and permanent value. His Congregationalism of the Last Three Hundred Years, as seen in its literature, is one of the most important works in church history produced on either side of the Atlantic. While Stuart was bringing forward his exegetical treasures from Germany, James Murdoch, at the same institution, was doing the same work for the German church historians, adding, himself, most valuable materials. Ezra H. Gillett was an historian of painstaking research. His Life and Times of John Huss and History of the Presbyterian Church are comprehensive works. Hatfield, Nutter, and Duffield have written valuable works on the history of hymns. The latter's investigations into Latin hymnology are specially worthy of mention. Charles P. Crowth has given the results of his study of the Reformation in a notable volume, and E. J. Wolfe has published a graphic account of the Lutherans in America. America has achieved preeminent success in theology proper. The long line of New England theologians is a list of sturdy thinkers which no other land surpasses. Charles Hodge was for over a generation the Nestor of Calvinism. His systematic theology is a textbook wherever the English language is spoken. His son, Archibald A. Hodge, continued his father's work in his father's spirit 
and with his father's ability. Robert J. Breckinridge was the Charles Hodge of the South, though lacking in a certain Catholicity of view which characterized the great Princeton theologian. James Richards did good service at Auburn. Daniel D. Wedden was a most virile thinker. His prelections are among the finest specimens of theological debate to be found anywhere. James W. Dale is famous for his elaborate works on baptism. Louis F. Stearns left one of the most important books of the present time as the monument of his short life, namely, The Evidence of Christian Experience. J. P. Boyce and J. L. Dagg, both Baptists, have treated systematic theology. Horace Bushnell exerted a wide influence on the thought of his time. His works on Christian Nurture and on The Vicarious Sacrifice are among the most suggestive treatises in the whole range of theology. Charles G. Finney impressed his views of truth on a wide circle of pupils and hearers. He was the founder of the Oberlin Theology. Enoch Pond was a veteran instructor and author. Henry B. Smith mediated between Calvinism and modern theology. His posthumous lectures, edited by his pupil, the late Professor Carr, are among the most valuable books of the kind in our literature. Minor Raymond was the first Methodist theologian to produce a complete systematic theology. Randolph S. Foster, after a number of minor theological discussions, such as Beyond the Grave and similar works, began a colossal undertaking in systematic theology under the general title of Studies in Theology. Stephen M. Merrill has treated certain departments of systematic theology, especially in eschatology and baptism, with great skill. John Miley has produced a systematic theology at once original, liberal, and fully recognizing the latest investigations. Every theological seminary has its authority in this science, and men now venerable have made able contributions in published volumes. The churches of Europe have produced the most scholarly treatises on pastoral theology known to Christian literature. The conduct of a parish has been sung in the poems of George Herbert and others, developed by Baxter and many other writers in special treatises, and illustrated by the labors of Baxter, Howe, and many generations of devoted pastors. Many of them have become the honored teachers of the American Church. We have depended mostly on the German writers, whose treatises have been translated into English and made to do service in the United States. The most popular of the foreign works of this class has been Vinay's Pastoral Theology, which, however, has been left in the background by later works. Theology, as an applied science, has had in the United States an unparalleled field for experiment. The problems of Christian life and work with us are so numerous as to remove the science of pastoral theology quite out of the limitations of the state churches, and to give it a larger place in the service of the church. The labors of Ebenezer Porter, James W. Alexander, Daniel P. Kidder, and Austin Phelps are fair specimens of how well the American mind can conduct the treatment of great pastoral questions. All practical subjects have been discussed with singular fullness and promptness. Hitchcock, Barons, Ely, and others have shown the relations of the labor question to Christianity. The Sunday School, in its most modern phases, has enlisted the services of Wise, Vincent, Tunbull, Hurlbut, Eggleston, and many others. Missions, Evangelical Work, Sabbath Observance, Humane Efforts, and many other departments of ecclesiastical activity, have interested writers of all the great churches, and the fruit of their pens has become the immortal treasure of the Church, both in Europe and America. The record which the American Church has made in the great work of Christian defense is excellent. The echoes of the skepticism of the old world, which have reached our shores, have left no harmful result. The people of the United States, even from the early colonization of the country, 
have never given hospitality to the rationalism of Germany or the deism of France. Our greatest danger arose from the force of Thomas Jefferson's example of sympathy with French infidelity, and of Thomas Paine's gross skepticism. But the great revival at the beginning of the present century was of incalculable influence in producing an evangelical spirit, from which the American church has never shown the least disposition to retire. There has been some variety in attachment to the Christian foundations. In New England, the disposition has been stronger than elsewhere to make concessions to the opponents of the Orthodox communions. In the Middle States, the field for rationalistic opinions has been less inviting, and these have never secured more than occasional favor. In the southern states there has never been any yielding to skeptical influences. All the churches in the southern states have, from the beginning of the colonial period down to this day, stood side by side in loyalty to the faith of the church in its periods of reform and evangelization. The arduous experiences of James Freeman Clark, in his pastorate of a little group of Unitarians in Louisville, are a fair type of the difficulty, from the beginning, of planting any other than principles of evangelical Christianity on southern soil. It is in harmony with the general evangelical trend of the American Church that we should find among American theologians a goodly number of heroic defenders of evangelical faith, and yet who are advocates of a growing and aggressive theology. Indeed, in no country do we find a keener appreciation of the labors of the eminent Christian apologists of Germany, France, and Holland, such as Neander, Thalluck, Hegstenberg, Lang, Allman, de Presence, Van Prinsterer, and Van Oosterzee, than in the United States. Our American founders of A New Theology have generally met with only scanty success, and have at last bequeathed but a poor inheritance to their unfortunate successors. Philip Schaff, here, as in many fields, has benefited the American Church by his prompt recognition of the dangers of German rationalism. George P. Fisher, by his Supernatural Origin of Christianity, gave prompt notice that American scholarship was on the side of evangelical Christianity. William Nast, in his Introduction to the Gospels, has produced one of the most successful and convincing refutations of Strauss and his school. Joseph Cook has given such a popular rebuke to the advance of skeptical theology that all lands have been benefited by his unique career. These are representatives of a large class of men who are of supreme influence in shaping the theology of the American Church. There is every reason to expect that, in the battle for a firm and aggressive faith, the Church of the United States will be as devoted in its attachment to the Divine Word in the twentieth century as it has been in the three centuries already past. End of chapter 31 End of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst Thanks for listening.